Why should not be too harsh with the, the so-called minimum consensus reached in Buenos Aires last December by the G20 leaders? Some media call it uh, a um, sham or a window dressing consensus, or uh, more artistically, as we say in France, a trompe-l'oeil consensus. But I don't think that's fair, because it's uh, hard to blame a summit for lack of agreement when there isn't on the table much the heads of state and government could agree upon. When one speaks of summits, Sherpas come instinctively to mind. But the Sherpas of international organizations are, after all, diplomats trained to uh, draft around the largest common denominator. And it happens, for those of you with a taste for math, uh, between prime numbers, the greatest common denominator happens to be one. In other terms, there is no meaningful common denominator. But even if these Sherpas were like the other Sherpas, the Sherpas of the Himalaya, trained, uh, biologically adapted, says a medical paper I recently fell upon, biologically adapted or trained to carry to the summits whatever the expedition may need up there. Even if they were like that, they wouldn't be to blame for what is in the package and ultimately happens to be needless at the summit, or would have been useful, but is missing from the package. If this uh, summit r ran out of gas, I hope a joke is permitted even when talking about serious matters, because in my experience, joking can help uh, not only correct bad practices that Romans would have said, but also to uh, question uh, a priori conclusions that one used to take for granted. If it did run out of gas, all the better. To me, the very notion of things uh, starting with an agreement at the summit and then top-down implementation from there is amateurish, not to say undemocratic. I would rather trust the opposite approach, one starting with common ground developed by uh, professors, no matter whether Nobel laureates or not, used to peer-reviewed publication of uh, world-class compelling content. Students, research centers and businesses, all forms of uh, intermediate bodies, including cities, ultimately coming to national and international attention. If it did run out of gas, this is the time for outreach in preparation for the next round, and that's what this site is about. Outreach does not just amount to advocacy. It is, as the word itself would suggest, the action of tending one's hand with whatever output one has to offer and asking for additional input worth being submitted at the highest level. The time for outreach is the time for uh, strategies uh, the climb down to tactical detail with systematic analysis of side effects, including those which uh, have to be handled by agencies other than the proponent agency or are not immediately anticipated but still can happen with an unzero probability. Normally, that is what I uh, would expect Sherpa meetings to be about balancing the load and deciding what each one will be carrying. I happened to be in Buenos Aires between uh, late April and early June last year, by the time the second Sherpa meeting was taking place. I even had a chance to uh, visit the office of the Sherpa of the host country, Argentina. It wasn't to me to uh, ask how they were coordinating that, but that left me plenty of time to look out at what was going on 
Well, they did. What I saw looked much like uh, a uh, flight from money episode, and this did in itself provide food for thought for the think tank I was supposed to contribute. The first time I exchanged euros for pesos on April the 22nd, the exchange rate was 25 to 1. And the last time, one week before my departure, on June 8, that exchange rate was 30 to 1, or a 20% hike in uh, a mere six weeks. The newspapers in Buenos Aires blamed uncoordinated dollar sales by the central bank. But I also had a chance of uh, visiting relatives in the south of the province of Santa Fe. The harvest had not been good, which meant that the central bank would have less dollars from exports to sell, regardless of whether it did so in a coordinated or uncoordinated fashion, and was bound to undershoot the problem. More important, I concluded that the prospect of receiving more pesos for each dollar, if they managed not to export immediately, uh, was not precisely the best inducement for them to export right away. I did not come to know much about a lifeline requested from the IMF when I was leaving, and I would bet the people who demonstrated in the streets against that arrangement did not know much either. From the little I knew, and from the little they knew, it appeared that Argentina would not be in a position to comply with the terms of an agreement drafted in such a hurry. But uh, more seriously, nobody else was volunteering to land. This arrangement lived for a mere three months, and the lender of last resort renegotiated in September. The exchange rate stabilized in the dirty float zone agreed, and the flight from the peso was contained at the cost of uh, interest rates in excess of 60% uh, at those heights. The eternal question of whether the national currencies overappreciated or underappreciated can only be answered with some form of a guesstimate. Three months later, the G20 summit did with what was on the table, and that was uh, scattered proposals coming from different departments, agencies or directors, each tasked to an individual facet of an individual issue. Worse, most claim to be evidence-based, now a deprecated expression because all evidence-based means is that evidence to the contrary coming from other facets of an issue or a related issue were not available to the proponent. Not many such evidence-based proposals sounded compelling, unbiased, or systematic enough to be influential. Not many were sustainable over time, I mean, found their place in the continuum between short-term and long-term. Professors Nordhaus and Romer shared the Nobel Prize in Economics 2018 for their integration of climate change and technological innovation into long-run economic analysis. They uh, delivered their acceptance lecture on uh, December 8th. That was too late to gain mind space in the general public for these two agenda items, climate change and technological innovation, and their consequence, the future of work. Work is the L factor in the production equation, and that equation is likely in the future to look quite different. The summit was heavily criticized for failing to deliver on all three, uh, environment, technological change, and the future of work, both during and after the transition to a cleaner, more modern economy. Let's take them uh, one by one, an environment-friendly economy. The existing international agreement is shaky, 
and uh, what each state has to do at the domestic level and when isn't clear in the Paris Agreement. Same from an inclusive perspective for what the richest have to do to, for the poorest and even more so what countries with centuries of carbon emissions behind them have to do for those who barely emerge to industrialization. Whether the US have left or will be leaving or can at all leave is also unclear. Governments of the environment appear happy to leave it to their colleagues of commerce to account for exports of waste or subcontracting of dirty activities to poor or corrupt countries, both are possible, they are no less happy to leave it to their colleagues of finance to find the appropriate discount rate between the pain of today in the form of higher taxation of fossil fuels and the gain for future generations in the form of carbon damage averted. Some heads of state or government had barely left the summit when they made the direct experience of how thorny the issue of a tax per gallon of fuel can be. Some of my policy analysis lectures are about crash testing in vitro policies before they are implemented or even announced. Even experiment on the living human being uh, causes a violent reaction, then political opponents jump in and uh, capitalize on legitimate frustration to increase their own political space and throw in totally unrelated issues. And then a problem with one policy spirals into a problem with every policy announced by the same government and the government, the whole constitutional system maybe, is in trouble. First, the tax receipts of a per gallon tax need to be high enough to subsidize in part those who cannot help emitting. That is the opposite of what one would expect from a policy intended to curb down emissions. For the sake of argument, let's assume the poor own old dirty cars and live in rural areas without access to public transportation. They pay more tax. One could not serve political opponents better. The government gives to the rich, takes away from the poor. Second, those who can afford modern, clean cars and live in cities with public transportation do not need to drive much. So they drive less and mathematically their emissions are lesser so they pay less. How about a progressive carbon tax instead of the flat per gallon tax? It could be based on say uh, horsepower and uh, there could be differential rates for certain types of cars. You want to show off you uh, pay more tax. There could even be room for a gradual adjustment with a rate starting at zero the first year and then increasing over time to capture the fact that older cars are assumed dirtier but still giving people the time to adjust. You still haven't adjusted, naturally you pay more or you want to uh, drive a vintage car well, that is uh, very, very expensive. This site reaches out for contributions towards a nationally acceptable and internationally inclusive formula to split the cost of a, a transition towards a cleaner economy, knowing that the debt cannot be taxed for the damage they caused, and those yet to be born in whatever geography get a free ride. Absent such a formula, I don't see what the G20 could have possibly agreed upon or uh, what kind of communication skills it would have taken to make this uh, easy to swallow for uh, those taxpayers who don't have the slightest doubt about how the government employs tax money 
I mean, how this government and the governments to come for the next 50 years as to taxpayers who have at least some degree of doubt I think one just gives up on them. Now take the other transition. Transition to a digital economy uh, governed by uh, big data or otherwise or more broadly uh, an economy governed by a radical technological change an economy in which the L labor factor of the equation will have to deal with a very very different T factor or technology factor. The summit endorsed the OECD menu of policy options for the future of work and that may be the most comprehensive working document we have available today. On the other hand, that menu is rather a catalog of existing issues. So clicking here or there uh, won't uh, provide you with uh, ready-made solutions to draw on. Click on productivity gap. Next screen says that there are frontier and lagging firms. In some markets the number of entrants is low due to high barriers to entry and in others the number of exits is too high due to a winner-takes-all competition. I must say I'm never very comfortable with heads of state or government who feel strongly against winner-takes-all competition to which after all they owe their positions. Nor am I really comfortable in higher education with universities where recruitment is not about expanding the academic offer but rather competing for preset positions. This means that I would be excluding a perfectly viable candidate if I win and uh, I would be excluded on a binary basis if I lose and neither appeals too much to me. On the spearhead side of the economy the number of entrants is high enough despite a low life expectancy smaller than optimal size and uh, winner takes all competition. In three years a startup will either have successfully showcased its technology and then gets acquired by uh, some incumbent closer to uh, optimal economies of scale with substantial profit for the founders or will have failed in proving any advantage over existing prior art and uh, disappear, exit the market with uh, substantial losses for the founders. In other terms Many startups, most I would say, enter the market to exit. On the lagging side of the economy, entrants are not many, basically because lagging is hopeless, rather than because the, there are high barriers to entry. Actually, on the lagging side of the economy, it would take negative barriers, in the form of uh, temporary tax exemptions, for instance, to motivate entrants, and uh, then the government is left with a delicate expectations management problem. Jobs have been created and the government was very happy about it. And then he has to explain why those jobs were destroyed as soon as the tax exemption came to an end. Concerning lagging firms, I see two possible options for the government. One is doing nothing watching them die one after the other as they are absorbed or are replaced by more progressive firms and uh, employment is destroyed either through redundancies or uh, because the profiles fitting the lagging firm no longer fit the modern firm. This option is naturally not on OECD menu. And the other one, the other option, is making the lagging firm progressive through public expenditure. And we cannot imagine this means buying from firms which employ obsolete technology. So it must mean funding research and development programs and uh, 
facilitating the dissemination of technology generated in this manner, governments are not insensitive enough to pick the first option, the do-nothing option, and lack resources to fund the second option. It would seem, in addition, that if uh, public money could pull a lagging firm to the frontier, private money would have done it. Investing public money in priority areas in which private investment is not likely to come takes a lot of confidence in one's choices and is very, very difficult for governments affected with suspicions of uh, favoritism or corruption. We will come back to corruption in a minute. But before we get there, there is another issue, the time to build issue, that Professor Finn Kinland, Nobel laureate 2004, could uh, explain to you in more precise and colorful terms than I can. It takes time to get the first marketable results from a freshly created R&D lab. And by the time they become available, the technology in question may already have been superseded by uh, another better, cheaper or less polluting technology. It takes time to retrain old workers to uh, new production methods and it might be advantages to pick the right profiles straight from the market. Another menu item is uh, the simplification of regulatory frameworks to allow businesses to test new products and services, new business models, at least in areas in which that seems possible. It's more difficult in other areas and uh, the regulations allowing you to sell a drug or uh, an organic food in the market are not necessarily to be tampered with. The simplification of regulations, needed as it may be in several cases, is not something you should expect overnight effects from. If the product or service was precluded from the market yesterday, businesses are not ready to launch a product that was prohibited yesterday, and they ask themselves, uh, will this new permissive regulation still be in force? by the time I'm ready, as a minimum, and for both transitions. Transition to a cleaner economy and uh, to a digital economy governed by uh, big data, for instance. The menu mentions support for those who will inevitably suffer adverse distributional effects. Whatever action in the menu or outside the menu one wants to take, I see two options. One is funding them through tax and the other one is funding them through debt. The menu does not recommend one option over the other. But what does make sense when written on the blackboard could well not make sense at all in a context of unsustainable debt. Here, reflections on uh, debt levels that might be sustainable or uh, not be sustainable, took me back to uh, very old papers published when I uh, lived in Argentina and very recent notes taken in the same country when I was visiting. And between those two, Professor Sargent's lecture when accepting the Nobel Prize 2011. The stock of public debt is now in excess of 60 trillion. Half of those 60 trillion are owed by uh, two G20 countries alone. The US with uh, 20 trillion or 105% its uh, GDP and Japan with the remaining 10 trillion or more than 250% its uh, GDP. This paper says that the ratio of 77% of GDP is the tipping point after which the country starts experiencing adverse effects on growth. 77% exactly was the ratio of debt to GDP that Argentina showed after the first disbursement by the IMF under the agreement June, but before further disbursements under the agreement of September. It was also that of another 
G20 country, Brazil, and both are well above the tipping point the World Bank paper calculates for emerging countries, which is a mere 64% by contrast with the 77% I mentioned earlier. The US and Japan did not seem to have much trouble placing long-term low-yield bonds in the market and because these bonds are denominated in their own currency they might as well inflate out of debt if they want it. Emerging countries instead have to pay a premium in a currency that is not their own and could not even inflate out of debt for uh, bonds denominated in their own currency because to place them they have to pay an interest substantially in excess of the anticipated inflation. Intuitively, the cost of debt is bearable while interest rates are low. If they raise, additional interest payments come to curtail the possibilities of the government in areas related to sheer growth, such as cutting taxes or spending to pull the economy out of a recession. Note that the summit had barely the time to uh, welcome strong economic growth, although it had been asynchronous, when the first news concerning a global slowdown started coming in. This led me to think that if uh, growth alone was uncertain, we weren't at the right juncture to take firm commitments on explicit rules to make it more synchronous or more environmentally friendly or sustainable or inclusive, including in areas in which the limited lifespan of a person needs urgent solutions such as housing, health and uh, in more long-term oriented issues such as education. On the need for a rules-based international order, I don't think the summit could have done much better than patching the issue with a blue liner on their commitment to continue working together to improve it and uh, find responses that were timely and adapted to a rapidly changing circumstances. Not that anybody doubts that commitment, but as I said, national policies change rapidly in pursuit of an elusive uh, best rule, a point also raised by Professor Kidland in his uh, seminal paper Rules Rather Than Discretion, Corruption and Other Financial Action Task Force Related Matters, the summit itself said it would reach out towards relevant international organizations to further explore the possible relationship between corruption and other criminal activity. And there is room, however, for additional outreach here, targeting networks of uh, businesses and academia. We have room for outreach on money laundering. Money laundering is uh, relegated to a paragraph previous commitments to uh, combat more effectively terrorism and proliferation. The outreach we would like to conduct from here relates rather to uh, money laundering which is unrelated to terrorism and uh, concerning terrorism money staining of otherwise perfectly legitimate money at least on the surface going to fund terrorist activities. On corruption itself, I promised with uh, come to it, and the communique contains a two-liner confirming the commitment of the heads of state and government to combat it with a new action plan 2019-2021, inspired mainly, I believe, by the principles on preventing corruption and securing integrity published by the OECD, not every country has successfully implemented the UN Convention Against Corruption and I feel this is one of the areas in which there is a very low drafting to enforcement ratio. Taking it from there, our outreach efforts will start with um, the abundant literature to the effect that corruption has a cost in terms of growth. That literature, however, institutions, which is not always the case. We will focus here on a growing corpus of literature 
concerning uh, corruption in countries with uh, poor institutions or poor interaction between institutions which might be all right per se. In uh, a few agenda items, the summit specifically reached out for uh, smarter contributions. You know what smart means? Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. The E and the R in smarter would stand for evaluated consistently, reaching past the comfort zone of stakeholders. For some years now, the purpose of my law and literature courses has been to increase student awareness of issues that have uh, come to be called emerging, basically because nobody saw them coming. More specifically, provide them with a framework in which peer-reviewed responses to issues could be tested in vitro without the cost and pain of conducting experiments on the human being. 500 years after the publication of this book by St. Thomas More, it was about time to address the uh, emerging issue of uh, governance of international relations between the island and uh, the other neighboring islands in areas such as uh, migrations and trade. The hypothesis is that their economies and political systems must be to a certain extent networked. The coasts of uh, these other islands are visible in the map published together with the first edition of this book. In 2017, for the 10th anniversary of the award of the Nobel Prize in Literature to Doris Lessing, I focused on her novel The Good Terrorist. My main focus was on how these uh, terrorists are funded. I placed the word terrorists in between quotation marks pointing towards ambiguities in the definitions and uh, shortfalls in the drafting in both international uh, conventions and guidelines. In 2018, I published Identity and Exile, Findings of Fact and Opinions of Law in Bellini's La Straniera. While I the title was basically to capitalize on existing mind space already created by newspapers. The core purpose was to point student research in the direction of inclusion, exclusion and exit. This year I am contributing to a documentary on the Peninsula Valdez, listed as World Heritage 20 years ago. The project is codenamed Taking Salt to the Sea and it is about infrastructure and public-private partnerships. More specifically, it is about a railway built in 1901 to carry salt from the Salinas Grandes to Puerto Pirámides, where it was embarked to be sold in Buenos Aires and other places. The Concession Act, dated July 4, 1900, provided that there would be no government guarantees or subsidies and the project had to be completed within one year as effectively it was. Unfortunately, not every modern PPP, public-private partnership, makes as much sense as taking salt to the sea or is as cheap for the taxpayer. The project did make sense, actually, at a time when there was no alternative infrastructure to connect supply and demand. If the company went bankrupt in 1920, it wasn't because taking salt to the sea did not make sense, but rather because demand fell sharply after the First World War
and uh, the alternative technology, freezing or refrigerating the meat to be exported rather than salted, became more affordable and more widely available. So much for the transition to technical progress 